Federal Reserve may have made a big mistake. A global financial crisis may be coming soon. Jim Rickers said he's an American lawyer, investment banker, and a writer. This time, global financial disaster could be different and how that could change your life. I'm going to tell you how you could prepare at the end of the video. The first point I would make is that global recessions are rare. Recessions in individual countries or economic communities like the EU do happen with some uh, some frequency. But a global recession is different. Uh, it's usually the case that even when uh, a large group is in recession, somebody else is expanding. China, you know, in the 70s, they used to, 1970s used to call the U.S. the locomotive. You know, if Germany was in recession, somehow the U.S. could kind of power through, although the U.S. itself had three recessions between 1974 and, and 1982. But a world recession is rare. Uh, we had one in uh, around the time of the 2008 financial crisis, even though Australia did power through it okay, uh, and uh, certainly in 2020 during the pandemic lockdowns, but they're unusual. As I say, it's usually one, one group is in a little bit of trouble, but another group powers through and even can pull the recession country or group out of difficulty. But um, when global GDP declines, that's rare. We are heading for uh, exactly that. To understand that, let's um, let's take a look at some of the, the largest uh, economic uh, groupings, and I'll start with the, uh, the United States. Now, the United States had a mild recession in the first half of 2022. If you blinked, you missed it. First quarter GDP was negative, uh, not a lot, about 1.6%. Um, a second quarter GDP was also negative, about nine tenths of 1%. So first half as a whole, uh, we had negative GDP. The rule of thumb definition of a recession is two consecutive quarters of declining GDP. That's the rule of thumb. We had that. It's in the data. Having said that, it was mild. And third quarter GDP uh, and fourth quarter bounced back. Uh, but if there was a recession, it was mild. What I'm talking about is a much more severe recession, uh, much, much more difficult, uh, much sharper drop in economic output uh, beginning about now with rising unemployment, uh, slowing industrial output, uh, slowing retail sales, and importantly uh, for investors, uh, a very sharp decline in inflation. So this is one of the kind of mystifying points about the U.S. stock market. I mean, it seems straightforward to me, but market has their own dynamic. They're saying, well, um, if the Fed raises rates the way I've described and they cause a recession, the Fed's going to have to cut rates. That's called the pivot, the Fed pivot, and lower rates are good for tech stocks or buy stocks. But think about that for a second. What if inflation comes down faster than the Fed thinks? And I think it may, by the way, I'll, I'll, I'll return to that. What if inflation comes down really fast uh, and they get to the target rate sooner than they think? Um, does that mean they might have to cut? Well, it, it might, but what's good about that for stocks? I mean, if that happens, no one ever says, why did that happen? They just say, well, inflation may come down, interest rates may come down, so buy stocks. It's like, well, inflation may come down, interest rates may come down, but if it does, it's because we're in a very severe recession, exactly what I'm forecasting. And so if that's the case, stocks are going to plunge, you know, 30, 40, 50%. So don't root for lower rates, or if you're forecasting lower rates, understand what that means. It doesn't mean the Fed chickened out. It doesn't mean life is wonderful and you should buy tech stocks. It means that we're in the very severe recession that I described, and I think we will end up there, uh, and therefore stocks are going to plunge. So, uh, you know, be careful what you wish for, as they say. Um, the Fed's timeline is get to five and a quarter, let's say, by March, sit tight until 2024, inflation comes down, and then they can talk about cutting rates in 2024. That's what they're saying. My forecast is, yeah, they are going to raise rates. Uh, they're going to over tighten. They're going to cause a very severe recession. Um, and when they do, they may pivot at that time, but it won't be for good reasons. It'll be for very bad reasons, meaning we're in a recession and stocks have plunged. So don't, don't buy into the Wall Street chatter as far as, uh, as far as that's concerned. Because I say the Fed's going to over tighten. Now, why doesn't the Fed know this? Well, because they never know, because they have the worst forecasting record of any institution I can think of. Their, their entire history since 1913 is one blunder after another. Uh, and this will just be the latest uh, in a long series. And so just to kind of summarize, um, the Fed's on a course, we know exactly what it is because they told us. All you have to do is listen to them and believe them. They're going to raise rates to at least 5%, maybe five and a quarter. Their plan is to sit tight, let high rates do its work, do their work. Um, 
and see the inflation come down and maybe in 2024 cut rates. Uh, what I expect is they are going to raise rates for the next couple of meetings, exactly as I described, but they're going to over tighten. The signs of recession are, are already present. The Fed's not looking at them. I'll come back to what they are, by the way. Uh, and we'll be in a very severe recession for a lot of reasons in uh, 2023. And that's going to mean a plunge in stock prices. So if the Fed cuts rates, don't cheer too loudly because it'll be in a world where, um, a uh, severe recession, higher unemployment, and crashing stock prices are the norm. I like to uh, finish on a uh, can't call it a happy note, but global liquidity crisis. Now I talked about a global recession, and people go, "Well, isn't isn't that like your liquidity crisis?" No, uh, a recession or a depression um, is very different than a liquidity crisis or a financial panic. They're two different things. They can can and do happen separately. In 2008, we had both. In 2008, a recession or depression and a financial panic converged. So they can happen together, but they don't have to. They can happen individually. What we're, what we're in for looks like a global financial crisis and a global recession at the same time coming sooner than later. Now, why do I say that? Um, there's a global dollar shortage. People go, wait a second. The Fed printed nine trillion dollars, uh, which they did in 2020 has come down since then, but they did print that much money. Uh, how could there be a global dollar shortage? Well, what people don't understand is that behind the curtain off balance sheet, this is off balance sheet. You got to go read the footnotes and understand what you're reading. There are one quadrillion dollars of derivatives. And for those not familiar with Q word, one quadrillion is a thousand trillion. So I just said the Fed printed $9 trillion. Maybe it's down to $7 trillion. Yeah. But you have a thousand trillion dollars of derivatives. Uh, and they have to be supported with collateral. Not a hundred percent, not even 10%. I mean, kind of 1% or 2% is enough. But when you're in a liquidity crisis, banks are extremely choosy about which collateral they'll accept to support this quadrillion dollar inverted pyramid of derivatives. Um, and right now, what they're saying, because this evolves, it gets worse. It doesn't happen overnight. It can become acute overnight, but it happens over the course of a year or longer. What we see, the banks are saying, I, I don't want, I don't want corporate bonds as collateral. I don't want your mortgages as collateral. I don't even want 10 year treasury notes as collateral. The only collateral I want are, are short term U.S. Treasury bills. Treasury bills have a maximum maturity of one year, 360 days. But there can be four week bills, eight week bills, six month bills, et cetera. That's the only, that's the best form of collateral. It's the most liquid, easily traded, low volatility, easy to repledge is by far the best form of collateral. That's all the banks want right now. But if you're a foreign bank, you need dollars to buy the dollar based collateral. If you want treasury bills that are denominated in dollars, you need dollars to buy the bills. That's why the U.S. dollar is so strong. People go, wait a second. You know, the U.S. has a, you know, a multi-trillion dollar annual budget deficit, uh, a massive trade deficit, uh, 132% debt to GDP ratio, $31 trillion in debt. Uh, you're going into recession. How can the dollar be so strong? The answer is everything I just said has nothing to do with the demand for dollars in international foreign exchange markets. What's driving the demand for dollars is the need to get dollars to buy dollar denominated collateral, specifically treasury bills, to post as collateral to support the one quadrillion dollars of derivatives. And that's going to persist for until the system crashes, which it's in the process of doing. How could you prepare for a global financial crisis? Peter Lynch, one of the greatest investors of all time, he said far more money has been lost by investors preparing for corrections or try to anticipate corrections that has been lost in corrections themselves. What he said is that don't worry about financial crisis or disasters. If you worry too much, you're gonna miss out all the gains that stock markets gonna give you. I'm gonna show you. Look at S&P 500. For the past five years, there was a global financial crisis. It dropped, but it came back recover all the loss in the financial crisis and more look at that there was a bear market now it's going back up again if you look at all time the whole history there were so many crises along the way but it did not matter it does not matter and it will not matter look at that going down you can deceive 
dollar cost averaging when the stock markets are going down you invest regularly every week or every month then you gonna average down when it went down so when the stock market come back again you gonna make profits eventually over the long term just look at that you gonna make some more money by being so afraid by sending all your cash look at all the gains that you could have missed out so how can you invest in SME 500 there are three main SME 500 ETFs one of them is Vanguard 500 index fund VOO if you look at five year return 60.62% return for the past five years there's another one IVV 60.38% return for the past five years SPY for the past five years 60.64% return so the returns are not so much different so these three are the main SMB 500 ETF this is not a financial advice but if you look at SMB 500 if you do your own due diligence you're gonna see that SMB 500 tend to go up over time over the long run do you have any questions comment down below if you want to open a stock account the link is going to be down below.